I think we'll get started. Um, my name is Johannes von Moltke, and I'm very happy to welcome you to uh, this afternoon's event. Uh, on behalf of both the Center for European Studies, uh, which is presenting this event uh, as part of its conversations on Europe, and the Department of Germanic Languages and Literatures here at the University of Michigan, uh, where uh, we're hosting this both as part of the German Studies Colloquium, but also as part of the Werner Grilk uh, Conversations in German Studies that we're um, delivering this year. Um, uh, Werner Grilk was a colleague in the department after whom these lectures are named, and typically we would have done an annual lecture, typically we do an annual lecture, but um, for our pandemic-induced virtual world, we've reimagined that as a series of conversations, which we think is maybe more conducive to the, the Zoom medium, including today's. <clears throat> but we'll also have another one uh, that I just want to preview very briefly in April, when we'll welcome um, uh, Michael Rothberg and Susan Nyman to talk about um, memory, the Holocaust, race, colonialism, and what, if anything, we can learn from the Germans, which is the title of Susan Nyman's book. So join us for that on April 2nd at the same time, same place, different link, um, when we'll also say a little bit more about the place of the Grilk lectures in the German department itself. <clears throat> Today's event, uh, um, will be a conversation. Um, there will be uh, time for your questions and answers. Please use the Q&A function for that. Um, uh, we, we will try to monitor the chat as well, but I think you can't actually write in the chat. So use the Q&A um, to ask your questions at any point, and then I will uh, field them and, um, and pose them to the to panelists. Uh, also, for those who require it, uh, there is a live transcript available. Um, uh, if you click on live transcript, there's closed captioning. So um, welcome to both uh, Tiffany Florville and Kira Thurman. Um, I'll introduce uh, Tiffany first, uh, since this, is, uh, this event is built around uh, her new book, Mobilizing Black Germany. And as I was telling them, I learned from my uh, sister, a bookseller, to always bring the uh, physical copy. Um, congratulations to Tiffany on her new book. Uh, professor Florville is an associate professor of 20th century Europeans, women's and gender history at the University of New Mexico. She uh, co-edited the volume, Rethinking Black German Studies, and has published chapters in Gendering Post-45 German History and to turn this whole world over. Her new book, which we'll be discussing today, is Mobilizing Black Germany, Afro-German Women, and the Making of a Transnational Movement with the University of Illinois Press. It offers the first full-length study of the history of the Black German movement of the 1980s to the 2000s. It is met with great interest, as is evident. It just came out like a, a month and a half ago now, maybe. Um, uh, and as, as is evident from Professor Florville's event schedule, take just this week, on Wednesday she was uh, in um, British Columbia, virtually. On Thursday she was in Cologne for a transatlantic talk, that was yesterday. And so we're particularly grateful to have her here in Michigan today. Um, we'll be recording it for those who can't catch that, but if, but, if, but if you can't catch that, you could also see her next Friday at the Goethe Institute in Washington DC or the week after at UMass Amherst. <laughs> So um, clearly, uh, uh, Tiffany Florville is currently a busy woman um, based on this important new book. She's also a board member of the International Federation for Research in Women's History, an advisory board member for the Black German Heritage and Research Association, and an editorial board member for Central European History. She's also an editor of the Imagining Black Europe book series at Peter Long Press. She'll be in conversation with our colleague, Kira Thurman, who's an assistant professor of history and German studies at the University of Michigan, uh, the winner of uh, a Berlin prize, among other awards and fellowships, including the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, and the author of several award-winning title uh, articles on music, the Black Diaspora, and German-speaking Europe. And recently she did a star turn on TV when she joined a PBS. A feature on Marian Anderson with her expertise. 
her uh, uh, hotly awaited book, uh, Singing Like Germans, Black Musicians in the Land of Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms is forthcoming with Cornell University Press this fall. We're very excited. Um, so uh, before I pass the microphone to Tiffany and Kira, I wanted to just quote a, a, a review of um, Tiffany's book, which I thought uh, summarizes this just this this passage summarizes very well the importance of the book. Um, it was just reviewed by Samuel Klaus Hunicke in the Lon uh, Los Angeles uh, re Review of Books this week, and Hunicke writes, "quote It is rare." that a work makes such compelling interventions in so many directions. Mobilizing Black Germany looks to disrupt how white Germans see themselves and also how foreigners, Americans in particular, see Germany. At the same time, it reveals how a global Black diaspora was forged from within Germany looking out and from outside Germany looking in. Focusing as it does on the history of Black German activists, intellectuals, Hunica writes, quote, mobilizing Black Germany endeavors to do the same thing as its subjects, to make out a German history and a German culture in which Black Germans are integral. Um, and with that, I would like to pass the Zoom screen to Tiffany and Kira, and we'll mute myself and then come back uh, for the Q&A session. And we're thinking about 45 minutes or so. Thank you for being here and welcome both. Thank you. <clears throat> that was so, lovely, Johanna, thanks. Yes, thank you, that was lovely. So I think the plan actually right off the bat, right, is to begin with uh, me screen sharing and us reading a poem. So uh, we are doing this in part because, well, the poem is amazing. Um, and we're doing this um, in a lot of ways to introduce, for those who might not be familiar with this topic, uh, to introduce in some ways um, this amazing poet and activist, Maya Yim, and uh, the legacies of her work, which Tiffany talks about so well. Uh, so this is a poem called Afro-German One. Hopefully you all can see it clearly. Um, I think I'm reading the first page and then Tiffany's reading the second. So without further ado, here goes our reading. You're Afro-German? Oh, I see. African and German. An interesting mixture, huh? You know, there are people that still think mulattoes won't get as far in life as whites. I don't believe that. I mean, given the same type of education. You're pretty lucky you grew up here, with German parents even. Think of that. Do you want to go back someday, hmm? What? You've never been in your dad's home country? Oh, that's so sad. Listen, if you ask me, a person's origin, see, really leaves quite a mark. Take me. I'm from Westphalia, and I feel that's where I belong. Oh boy, all the misery there is in the world. Be glad you didn't stay in the bush. You wouldn't be where you are today. I mean, you're really an intelligent girl, you know, if you work hard at your studies what you're predestined to do, I'm sure they'll listen to you. While people like us, there's such a difference in cultural levels. What do you mean? Do something here? What on earth would you wanna do here? Okay, okay, so it's not all sunshine and roses, but I think everybody should put their own house in order first. Hooray, thanks for doing that with me, Tiffany. I think about this poem all the time. I think about how it's also one of the things I love so much about your book is the importance of poetry um, and that you argue for the imp importance of poetry for the Afro-German movement in particular. Um, so with this poem in particular, when was maybe the first time you encountered it? And what were some of your initial observations and thoughts when you started reading it? Yeah, that's a really good question, Kara. I mean, I first saw it in Fabikennen. So I was reading it in Fabikennen and I was like, what? who is she? <laughs> like, how could she write like this? Um, and it was so, um, it was so moving the the sort of way that she was able to sort of articulate the, the constant, um, the constant displacement that, that Black Germans um, feel. Um, and then that sort of reading it in Fabican and Fabican in, in itself is just like, um, just effective, you know, a range of effective, um, uh, effective connections that you feel with these individuals. Because you, you also go back to the time where you've been sort of racialized, when you've sort of dealt with sort of unbelonging. And so it's a really poignant, 
poem and um, I, I love it still. And it's, you know, and her read, you know, her reciting it in her sort of smoke, spoken word is also lovely. And you're just like, oh, ah, you're so amazing. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, I mean, for me, reading this poem for the first time ages ago, it, I mean, even reading it now, like to use that language about like, it's triggering me or whatever, it brings up all of these microaggressions and different kinds of aggressions that Black Germans face. And that for me growing up Black in Vienna that I feel like I also faced. Um, and it's just so fascinating to me. I think the reason why this poem has so much resonance, at least for me, um, thinking about it that way, uh, is because she's so able to capture, um, you know, the experience in a lot of ways that Afro-Germans and Black Germans and Black people in Germany more broadly uh, kind of go through on a, on a daily basis. So instead of simply just writing about Alltagsklassismus or everyday racism, mm -hmm. she's able to, you know, the, the fact that she turns it into a poem is just so much more powerful, I feel like, to me. Yeah, um, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we can come back to this poem, I think, at some point, but I have a slew of questions for you in relation to this poem, and Let's I know go. we're supposed to have a conversation about it, so I'm going to stop the screen share now and I can put up the poem again later, but the thing that I love about your work, uh, Tiffany, is that what you're, you're doing is putting that poem at the center in a lot of ways of a historical moment. And you're putting that poem and Maya Yim in general at the center of a movement. So I just have a couple opening kind of reflections and then and then of course we'll get into the questions. You know, so the question perhaps for everybody to be thinking about who's on this uh, Zoom thingy with us today, you know, is the question of how do you create a movement? And how do you grow it and sustain it? You know, and that what your book does so well is it offers us a chance to reflect on these questions and think about the power of Black activism and intellectual exchange. You know, it's such an important book, which I, I hope people really understand and recognize, in part because it is the first full length English speaking, you know, single authored monograph to actually narrate and grapple with the origins and transformative power of the Afro-German movement itself. It's this first book that's sort of asking us to consider the development of a Black German consciousness uh, that emerged and for us to understand how that Black German consciousness got sustained and maintained to where we are today. Because that's the thing that's so exciting to me right now is that we're in the moment of you know intergenerational kind of black activism and that we're pointing to this moment of the 1980s as we're talking about you know 2020 and the summer of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement as well. So the fact that you've done it is amazing. The fact that you have written this book um, that showcases and celebrates and narrates you know, this really fascinating complex story um, is the, the act as a historian of trying to figure out how to narrate right, how to narrate something um, is really the task at hand. And it's just so great to see that, that you've done that. Uh, uh, one other thing I want to point out, perhaps, you know, in terms of things to, you know, that I'm still struck by and that I'm thinking about with your book and also with you, is I just want everybody to recognize that you were one of the few tenured Black faculty in German history. Uh, that is you and Tina Kemp, I believe, who were tenured as Black faculty as German historians in history departments. Um, and that your book also, um, this book, which I will hold up again because everybody needs to see it, it is amazing and wonderful, um, that this book also is one of the first uh, English speaking monographs in Black German studies or in Black German history by a Black scholar to appear since basically Tina Camp and her book Other Germans in 2004. So it's like we're approaching a, a, a 15 or 20 year gap. You know, there's also Priscilla Lane's book. She's part of, I think, you know, this other moment, you and Priscilla Lane, who are creating and generating uh, new scholarship and new uh, new work uh, in this in this in this field. Um, and that again, to my mind, the thing that's so exciting about your book is that it's really the first one to document and to really figure out how to narrate this uh, really important moment in Black German history and Black German studies. Um, so I do have some opening questions perhaps to get people familiar with who you are and with your work in general is, you know, do you have a spiel that you use to begin to explain your work to people? Because I know I have a spiel, but I wanna know what your spiel is that you use uh, to, to talk to people about, you know, your work on the history of Black people in Germany. 
Yeah. I mean, I want to first say that, like, thank you for your comments. Like they were, I'm trying not to like cry so that I'm like <laughs> Robert Smith from The Cure so that my Addis <laughs> mascara falls to the <laughs> falls to my cheek. Um, because yeah, I, mascara. I, yeah. I, yeah, I need to wear waterproof mascara. Um, <laughs> and I also just, I, I admire your work. So it's just great to hear, um, that you got it. Um, and so, yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess I, I do have a spiel. I'm usually the spiel is my personal experience in Germany. Um, the spiel is basically like I was an exchange student in Germany and I was totally racialized um, at my gymnasium. The N word was uh, uttered. Um, I was like associated. I was told that like, it's my fault that the drug dealers are in town. I was like, I don't even know them. There's no black club, so I don't really. <laughs> We don't have a handshake. There's not a like membership card. I don't know them. You didn't get the membership card? I didn't, I didn't get the membership card. It did not come um, via Deutsche Post. So I don't know what's going on. Um, in the mail. So yeah, I know. Yeah. So I think it's based on those sort of racialized experiences from my own personal experiences that I felt drawn to studying Black German experiences. Um, and you know, I, was, I knew a few Black Germans in my, um, in my neighborhood, but not a lot. And they would be like, hey, Tiffany. And I'd be like, hey. Um, and that was it. And so I felt compelled to study more about them. And then I didn't, but I didn't know anything about Fab Buchanan until I came back to the US. So mm. I think that's striking that like, okay. I didn't discover Fab Buchanan in Germany. Yeah. I discovered Fab Buchanan once, my, once I returned to the US and I was like, mm -hmm. I need to learn more. And so I just like devoured as much as I could. Um, and that's why I was like, oh, I need to study um, Black Germans, um, mm -hmm. Black German history, Black German culture in the 20th century. Hmm. And so I feel like uh, I was on a panel with like Robin Mitchell um, a, a month ago. And she's like, I think I'm just going to study Black women for the rest of my life. And I feel, I feel like I'm just going to study Black Germans um, for the rest of my life in, um, in a variety of ways. So yeah. um, it's just, uh, I feel like learning and sort of studying more about the Black diaspora in Germany gives me a bit more perspective about the diaspora more broadly. It also shapes how we see identity. It shapes how I see my own identity. So like it's been a fruitful, it's been a fruitful um, discovery and it's a feel that I'm not going to leave. Um, they may have to kick, you know, you guys may have to kick me out and be like, it's time for you to go um, leave <laughs> us. But for now I'm, I'm, I'm so committed to staying in the field. Yeah. Really quickly, for those who don't know, Faba Bikenen or uh, Showing Our Colors is this landmark book. I do, I can share the screen for a moment if it would help for people to see it, uh, to see the cover of it. But it's this landmark book that came out in, uh, where is my PowerPoint? Um, well, I guess I can show this one. That's fine. Uh, this is a different clip, but whatever. Um, so, oh, are you all seeing, what are you all seeing? Faba Bikenen. You do see it? Okay. The Fisher, the Fisher version. Yeah. The Fisher version. Right, right, right. So I'll make it sort of full screen uh, for a minute. It's taking my computer a minute to get there. Um, right, which is this landmark text that appeared in 1984 or what year did it first appear? I think it's 1986. 86, sorry. Okay. It first appeared in 1986. And it, and we talk about it. And the reason why we're always talking about it or why we're constantly saying Faba Bikenen or showing our colors, um, you know, is because it's this landmark book. It's one of the first sort of really co collective publications in which Afro-German women and Afro-Germans in general come together to write and publish about their experiences. Um, and that, well, I mean, Tiffany, you know way more about, because this is a subject in your in your book itself, that, um, you know, uh, you know way more about uh, about the process of coming together uh, to do this, but I, I say this so that you know we're we're talking about uh, we're talking about Faba McKinnon in passing, but just and it'll come up later on in conversation as well. But just to recognize its importance as a text of Black German history and as a text that is, you know, so central to the Black German movement that developed in the 1980s, um, and that really, to my mind, is this like document of the Black German movement itself. Uh, in the 1980s, which is really special. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I should also mention that the English version was translated um, in 1992. So That's right. it's like showing our colors is the English translation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which, book. yeah, which I loaned to somebody. So I can't like hold it up right now with a physical copy, but otherwise I do, I do have it somewhere. Uh, yeah. So it's interesting. I think this is the first time I re I've, I've learned that you encountered while you were studying abroad as a high school student that you did meet some Black Germans or at least saw them in passing. Um, so at what point did you 
realize that that this could be an area of historical research for you into the field of, of Black German history and Black German studies? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it became, uh, I don't think I came to that realization until I came back to the US and I was, I had already committed myself to doing German literature. I was like, I'm going to do German literature. I'm going to talk about like German literature in the post-45 period. So clearly I was invested in the post-1945 period. Mm -hmm. um, and so I took all of these literature courses and um, just had a ball. And then I just stumbled upon, I think, a progressive era history class um, with a phenomenal, um, so basically it's like uh, the progressive era in the US. And so oh, okay. I was like, huh. What is this area? And I loved the professor and was like, okay, I think I want to do additional history. Um, and so I took a variety of history courses. So eventually I double majored in German literature and languages and history. And so it's through the course of taking more courses, taking some independent studies with um, uh, one of my favorite German professors, um, Bridget uh, Meyer Katkin at FSU, um, mm -hmm. that I was like, ooh, I think I'd like to do something on Black Germans that like it could it could be a reality. Um, what that reality was, I don't think I fully recognized that until like my, the end of my senior year, where I was like, I think I should apply to grad school. Um, <laughs> so I think I should do. And then, so I thought about like Audre Lorde, I knew that connection. Okay. And so I was fixated on, I think when I applied initially to grad school, um, I was fixated on doing just women's movements um, in oh. Black German women's movements and African American women's movements and seeing the comparison and the comparisons and contrasts. And then it just shifted and I was like, oh, it's just, it's all about Black Germans now. Um, I'm not going back. Um, oh, interesting. We'll yeah. So you encountered, you encountered Black German studies and to a certain degree in college or at least yeah. started thinking about Black. Okay. And I always ask that question because like the shocking thing to me is I didn't encounter it until grad school until like really? my second year of grad school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which, and this yeah. is a well-known story that I share everywhere, yeah. but, but Beverly Weber Beverly. at UC yeah. Boulder was the one yeah. who introduced me to Black German studies and told me that it was something I could actually do. I had to ask her many times, like, are you sure I can do this? Is this like an actual thing, like a research field? And she was like, why are you asking that question? Like, of course it is. So um, yeah, and that's weird for me as well, because, and maybe this is part of our conversation today as well, that, you know, I had grown up in Vienna and I didn't know about the Afro-German movement until I also came to the States, right? So it's really interesting thinking about where we encounter different kinds of histories um, and where we learn about them. Um, but so I think to focus more though on you and on your book, which is kind of the point uh, of today, hopefully, <laughs> is I'm wondering, to begin with in some ways, you know, there, there, you recognize in your book early on that there had been other moments of Black German activism before the 1980s. So I guess my question is, what is it about the 1980s movement that's somehow so powerful and so transformative? And what do you think it is perhaps about, if you can tell people a little bit about Audre Lorde, um, the activist, uh, you know, and her, and her role in it as well, like what is it about this moment that's somehow so pivotal, so important, and has become, I think, to a certain extent now, um, an established narrative, in part thanks to your work, but you know, yeah, I'm just curious to hear you talk about that. Yeah, that's a great question, Kara. I think there is was a sort of confluence of events. I think there are a, a large, a sort of a large contingency of individuals from the African diaspora were in like Berlin. Um, so you had like African expats, you had South African apartheid activists, you had filmmakers. I think for a while, Kathleen Collins um, was in Berlin. Um, Kathleen Collins is a famous was a famous uh, filmmaker. She, um, uh, and so you have this sort of cadre of individuals who are in Berlin exchanging. It's also, so I think my moves to Berlin in like 84. Um, so there's all of this, this sort of interesting mobility of um, individuals of African descent and they exchange ideas. Um, and of course, um, Lord is one of those sort of diasporic resources that they're able to sort of rely upon. Um, and she comes to um, the Free University of Berlin in 1984, or I think Mai comes to Berlin a little bit before um, uh, Lord. So it's either sort of 83, 84, excuse me with the dates. Um, I know I'm a historian, I need to, you know, I need to get those dates. Um, but it's, uh, but it's interesting. So Lord comes to Berlin and she's like, wants to meet black Germans and she, she's, 
she discovers them in New York. She learns that there's a black German community in New York mm -hmm. and it's like, oh, I want to meet them when I go there. And so she's teaching these courses. She's teaching like free literary courses or literature courses, excuse me. And she's connecting with sort of Maya Eim and Katarina Gontoya and sort of other women who are coming and going into these classes. And it's from there that these women are like connecting with each other and then connecting with others. There's also like informal connections. So at the time, like, um, 1985, 86, there were a series of documentaries on um, German television about sort of black Germans. Um, and so many of them met informally in their homes to watch these films and to mm -hmm. talk about these films. So mm -hmm. there are a variety of um, uh, sort of informal networks that led to this moment, I think. Yeah. And I think there's a large cadre, we're a large cadre of people of the diaspora um, prior to, you know, especially when we think about like the early 20th century sort of interwar period. Right. I think it's a distinct sort of demographic shift um, okay. that occurs. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that there's, yeah, that might be, and that's helpful for me to think about as well, a demographic shift between the 1920s, where you do have organizations like, you know, the Afrikanische Hilfsverein, uh, you know, African help, self-help organization, and things like that, one of the first documented kind of Black movements or Black organizations, you know, versus the Afro-German movement in the 1980s, and how it, it does represent a, a different kind of, perhaps, uh, Black population, Black demographics. The other thing, I mean, a couple other examples I'm finding so striking from your book as well in this way about the building of a movement is precisely how Black German women were able to come into contact with one another. You have an amazing treasure trove of letters that you use to show, you know, dialogue and things like that. But I'm still struck by stories, um, and I've known about this one for a while, but seeing it in your book again it just reminded me of it. It was so inspiring. Um, the shocking thing of Audre Lorde you know, after a, a research presentation, you know, to hundreds of people, right? Like, or not a research, but after after presentation, after this huge event celebrating uh, Audre Lorde, was it at the FU Berlin? Or I forget where it was in particular. Yeah, I can't, it wasn't a reading at the FU. It was a sort okay. of a reading either at Cologne or okay. another sort of reading, but Okay, yeah. right. And so there's hundreds of people there. And then at the end of it, she says, okay, um, I'm kicking all the white people out. Right, and so she kicks the white people out, and then it's just these black women left, and she was like, "Okay, black women, find someone you don't know and get her contact information." Yeah. No, yeah. like I, yeah, I mean, so I mean, Lord was sort of ballsy anyway. Like the sheer fact that she's like, "Thanks for coming, white peeps. <laughs> See you on the other side of not today." Um, <laughs> you know, like it's like thank you for coming to my reading I'll yeah. see you later um yeah. and I, I mean and I heard the story again from like Rhea Cheatham um so for a while during my dissertation research I was living with Rhea because I had Schimmel in my oh. for my first Berlin apartment in um Peaberg had Schimmel and so oh, I had no. to leave the apartment and Rhea was like come live with me and I was like okay and so when we're sitting down at the kitchen table, she's like, I'll just never forget this moment when Lord basically tells the white audience members to leave and tells us to connect with black German, other black women in the audience. And I was like, what did it make you feel? I think like, we're, she's like, of course we're, you know, sort of shocked that she's saying like white people leave. <laughs> and then we're like amazed that she's helping us connect to one another, you know? Okay. And I was just right. like, that's just such a powerful, a powerful intervention. Yeah. Um, and it's so not German, you know, like just thinking about, just thinking about how Germans interact socially. It's just not, it's That's just so not a common, I don't think it's like a common, uh, uh, sort of common practice. So it's also right. like, wow. Um, right, the sort of introducing yourself to strangers type thing. Exactly. Yeah, and getting their contact and, and forming, as you say a lot in your book, you know, kind of kinship and affective ties uh, with an A, affective and emotional ties. And we see that in this in this moment, which is so fascinating to think about that you're capturing as well, of, of how Audre Lorde, at least to me, it's one example of how Audre Lorde was able to empower Black German women. Um, yeah, uh, and just with these kinds of radical acts that the first time you hear about them are shocking, you know, yeah. but then also do this maybe productive kind of labor. Yeah. And she did the same thing in her classes too. Like she um, really tried to encourage a space for like black women in her classes. Um, and that's really, really nice for them too, in terms of like, wow, I get to speak and my, my ideas matter um, and validated. 
Um, and she just was interesting in terms of the sort of listening to her audio in some of the classes. So at the FU, there's audio of um, some of the uh, of her classes. And so I listened to some of it. Um, and I, I mean, her ability to navigate the silences. So she would ask like, you know, these really, you know, critical questions about poetry um, and that the silence abounded and she was unabashed. She was not afraid of it. And like, and, and sort of in, in contrast to like my teaching where I'm like, oh my God, the students are silent. I need to <laughs> fill the silence with, with more talk. Um, <laughs> and she was just like, it's okay, think about it. Um, okay. and then, and then eventually they, they, they engage. Mm. Um, and so that ability to allow silence to be a pedagogical tool, yeah. as opposed to like a hindrance, which I oftentimes in the beginning of my teaching career was like, Oh my God, the silence will kill me. <laughs> um, right. Um, right. Yeah. It's just amazing. Yeah, so actually then that perhaps leads to this next question anyway, which is thinking about not only Audre Lorde, but the other figures in your work, you know, how you call them quotidian and intellectuals, like everyday kind of intellectuals, and recognizing, I think what I love about what you're doing is forcing us to wrestle with and reconcile and recognize Black thought. Um, and recognize that it comes in all kinds of different guises, um, whether it's Audrey, you know, and right. Uh, so, but not to get too carried away with it, but where does, I'm just curious, where does this phrase come from of like quot quotidian intellectuals? Um, how did you develop it? Um, and, and how did it end up helping you think about, about the kinds of, of uh, figures in, in your work in this moment? Yeah, I mean, I initially thought of another term. Um, I think uh, Ula Taylor talks about, um, sh you know, street, I think street walking feminism, when she mm. is referencing Amy Ashwood Garvey. Um, and I just thought, oh, there's something there in terms of, um, in terms of thinking about Black Germans more broadly. Mm. And so I was like, but they're, they're focused on the everyday, they're focused on everyday racism. Mm. They're using vernacular cultural forms to spread um, knowledge in a variety of ways. So it's not just textual, it's, it, it's actually sort of visual in terms of looking at art installations. It's also sort of musical. It's also sort of like that sonic ap approach. So I thought, ooh, they're really, um, they're really disseminating knowledge in, in the everyday and sort of mm. making the everyday a part of their sort of um, their, their approach to, uh, to really jolting German society to recognize uh, their, their racism and also the legacies of colonialism. Mm -hmm. And so I was sort of reading, you know, I think one of the reviewers was like, I don't know about this version that you had here. And I was like, okay. And it wasn't quotidian intellectuals. I think I like referred to something else. And, mm -hmm. and so I was like, let me go to Gramsci. And I was like, I'm, you know, I was like, I'm not, Certainly I'm not like, you know, I'm not like a Marxist historian by any stretch of the imagination, but there was something useful in looking at Gr Gramsci's concept of the organic intellectuals. Um, and I thought, ooh, they're not organic intellectuals in the Gramscian sense. They're not trying to, you know, really initiate a Marxist, re um, re Marxist um, revolution. They're also not necessarily linking up yeah. to mainstream intellectuals like, right. you know, Gramsci right. intends, um, but I feel like there's something there. And so I think I was like, ooh, the everyday, everyday racism, this mm -hmm. seems a, a more common um, concept. And now, I mean, I, so now instead of thinking about the concept further, because I'm trying to write an article where I develop this concept a bit more, I, it's like, it's a part of the Alltagsgeschichte mm -hmm. tradition. Oh, like, yeah. You know, like, how did I like, duh, um, that like, I, how did I not necessarily link that in the book ex explicitly, but I do see it as a part of this larger, you know, German practice yeah. of intellectualism and storytelling. Um, yeah. And so I do see this, this, this concept as, as evidence in how Black Germans were able to navigate and negotiate and produce um, knowledge in a variety of forms, like you said, a variety of guises, right. um, and that we don't necessarily, we don't think of them as thinkers. Uh, we think of them as sort of doers, but I really was keen on saying, look, they're everyday intellectuals. Their content is everyday. Their form is everyday. Their ability, I mean, like, that's why I love, like you said, that's why I love Afro, um, Afro German one, because it's a the primary example of everyday intellectualism. Every day. Yep. Like it is yep. the, it is like sort of being, it embodies the everyday, yeah. um, everyday experience. 
everyday yeah. experience, the everyday knowledge that they have to sort of negotiate with white Germans who constantly, constantly sort of, you know, kick them out of the nation. Um, so I think it's a, a really good uh, term. And I, so I took a shot and sort of using it. And then the reviewers are like, okay, I guess this is, this is okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, I guess this okay. works. I mean, the other, yeah. Oh, sorry. The, the other thing I like about the term, which maybe leads to the next question anyway, is how I'm wondering if this idea of the quotidian intellectual or the everyday intellectual is also a, a feminist practice, in particular, a gendered practice. Um, and so, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about yet is the fact that this is a book that focuses on Afro-German women, um, more specifically than it focuses on men. Um, and so I was wondering if you could maybe explain to other people, to explain to folks here, you know, where does that come from? Why is the focus more on women than men? And how are their experiences perhaps, you know, maybe different in this way with, you know, and that, that's maybe how I'm also now thinking about this idea of the quotidian intellectual or the everyday intellectual that, you know, um, that the ways in which women perhaps might generate thought in ways that are different, or at least in this moment, the way that Black German women generated thought, but which is different than in other kinds of contexts. Yeah, especially when you think about like Fab McKinnon as the catalyst for the movement. It's a book fixated on like Black womanhood, Black yeah. German womanhood yeah. in, in, in essence. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not different from previous scholarship on um, the Black German movement, which is usually sort of like a sentence like, oh, ISD existed, a differ existed, boom shaka luck but they don't really write boom shaka luck in their papers um, <laughs> and there's this sense that like you know it's women who are driving this queer women who are driving this um and they're connected to feminist networks they're connected to activist networks in um in bremen in hamburg in munich a lot of them are connected to local feminist activist um networks in their um in their in their you know states and so I think it's that ability to sort of um, to come together with that sort of political knowledge of activism in terms of using their experience in the women's movement, also using their experience in the lesbian um, and gay movement as a way of um, you know forging ahead. Um, and so I think I'm, I'm similar in other scholarship in which they sort of focus on Black German women um, and the significance for Black German women, especially Black German queer women. Um, but this is why I like um, some of the new scholarship that's coming out in Black German studies, like from Priscilla. Priscilla's book uh, really does a great job of focusing on like what the, you know, what Black German male um, um, identity looks like, how it shifted, mm -hmm. how we see um, a really interesting, sort of, especially when she ends with Philip Capo Kapsel's work, how we see a future for sort of Black German men. Um, and I think in the in my book, you sort of see Black German are, men are there, but I don't really sort of elaborate more about sort of their intellectualism. And, um, and so that's, that is something I'm fully aware of. Um, and so I think that's why I'm interested in sort of a lot of this new scholarship, mm -hmm. um, like Priscilla, I know that also Vanessa Plumley has written about sort of Black German yeah. hip hop. Right. Um, uh, right. And, you know, uh, the list goes on. Right. But you know, whenever I can go back to um, back to Berlin, who knows where that'll be? Um, there's uh, there was a black German um, there was a black German male um, gay group. Um, oh yeah, that um, emerged in the eighties. Oh, in the eighties. Oh, okay. I thought I was thinking about today and just like the different there, kinds of. There is today, but okay, like yeah. in the eighties, there was one oh, interesting a group in the in Berlin, um, and so. Okay. It's only a footnote in the book, but yeah. I'd like to know more about yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely, of course. Experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I still have like a bunch of questions that I'm yeah. trying to be mindful of the fact okay. that we're going to take until maybe 10 more minutes or so. Um, the questions that I think I would like to ask, being selfish here, um, are, I think I'll focus on a couple of different ones. Um, and then if I have time, come back to some other ones. So one of them being, the challenges of writing Black diasporic histories more broadly, you know, and that uh, what I love about your work is it's showing how many different people, I mean, this is why it's also called, again, I'm gonna show it again, you know, why it's also called a transnational movement. <laughs> and Tiffany's like, Kira, stop, like this is getting embarrassing. Um, you know, that it's also a transnational movement, um, meaning that you're showing Black Germans in conversation with other Black folks from around um, the world, whether it's you know the UK thinking about the Black British movement, Black British women's movement, um, whether it's focusing on how I didn't know the the Afro German magazine Afaketa 
was modeled after the African American lesbian magazine, um, which name I forget, you know, and so you're, yeah. you're able to make Ashi, these connections. Yeah. Ashley, that's right. You're able to make yeah. these kinds of connections. Um, and, and that your work is also, I think, part of this new movement in general and scholarship turning towards Black internationalism. So I guess, how do you see yourself in this work as part of these conversations on Black diasporic histories and Black internationalism? You know, and how do you explore, to my mind, as well also the tensions that sometimes are there in doing this kind of scholarship that, you know, which perhaps we could talk about, I don't know if it's like, you know, between us or with everybody, you know, for example, one of the con concerns is like, and what you address in your book is to what extent do we take seriously this concern that you know African Americans such as Audre Lorde stand too much at the center of Black diasporic histories, right? So I'm just curious in general, like, which is such a big loaded question, but how you ended up seeing yourself and seeing this project within these larger conversations on right on, on how to write Black diasporic histories and how to write histories of Black internationalism. Yeah, I'm, yeah, this is, this, these are really great questions that I still think I'm grappling with, um, to be quite honest with you. Um, and I see your work also is like engaging in this, yeah. engaging in Black internationalism yeah. in a way that sort of is really focused on uh, what internationalism, sort of expanding what internationalism can constitute. Mm -hmm. So I think we oftentimes see it as like, ooh, it's like a political, social, and intellectual movement. Um, and I think in many ways, we're showing that for, for many um, individuals of, in the, the Black diaspora, it's a, a sort of hodgepodge of all of those things. Yeah. And that's yeah. always yeah. been social, yeah. cultural, political, intellectual, okay. and it never it never disappears. And I think with your, you know, with your with the sort of historical actors that you're looking at, that, that it's clear that like, in many ways, they are, you know, entering discourses about race that they, you know, oftentimes affirm or contradict mm -hmm. in interesting ways. Mm -hmm. um, for my own work, I feel like, ooh, I'm still trying to grapple with, yes, I guess I do do Black internationalism. Clearly my book is published in a Black internationalism series. I was going to say, in the series, yeah. yeah. It's in the series. Um, but in many ways, I think I was, I think I was interested in focusing on how the internationalism, how this notion of internationalism doesn't necessarily mean leaving borders. And so I think we oftentimes think, ooh, they've got a, they, they're, and, and please don't misunderstand me. Black Germans are very mobile. They're traveling, they're engaging, they're going to conferences, they're going to a variety of um, symposia. But in the same token, their internationalism is also nurtured and cultivated within the confines of Germany. Yeah. And, they're, and it's their connection with others across the diaspora in these cities, right. like Berlin, like Hamburg, like Munich. It's their interactions with um, individuals in Germany that really help them have even more of this sort of um, internationalist perspective. Okay. And okay. I think for like Black Germans too, they're so, they're so transnational. Their identities are so transnational. So they yeah. have this internationalism embedded, I think, yeah. in, in them already. Yeah, if, if I can jump in there really quickly and say perhaps to the audience as well, one of the things that makes, which Michelle Wright pointed out to me, and I was like, huh, you know, that one of the things that makes the st like studying Black Germans so fascinating in particular is that there's no one entry point or one way that Black people get to Germany, unlike in the case of the French or British empires, per se, right? So in the British case, my mother's British, you know, she's Jamaican, her family's, you know, British Jamaican. It's like so obvious. It's like, I don't even have to really spell it out to people. It's like Commonwealth story, blah, 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 Empire Windrush, blah, blah, blah. That's how my family got over there. There's no one singular narrative necessarily for how Black people get to Germany, which is what makes it so fascinating and so complicated sometimes when you're trying to figure out how to explain, like, you know, even when I try to explain, I don't know, like my own, my own situation, it's just, it's so complicated. That. Yeah. Yeah, oh, sorry, Nugu, did you want to say no, something? I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to just say, yeah, I feel the same way. So my mom's from Trinidad, you know, yeah. you know, the, there's a, there was a narrative. There's, there's sort a narrative. of oftentimes a post-45 narrative is like Windrush in a British case. Yeah. Um, there's, right. you're, absolutely, there's no singular narrative per se in the German case. And yeah, I think that's right, what's right. so compelling, but also simultaneously so difficult in trying to sort of narrate these discussions right. about who they are, who they've been, how yeah. Blackness evolves for them. Right. Which is why, again, I think this is what your book is doing so well, is you're showing us how people, Black people from various disparate threads have figured out how to come together, right? And you're showing yeah. us these moments 
when they, you know, when, again, this is what makes this a transnational story as it's taking place in Germany, right? How somebody whose father could be Ghanaian and mother white German or somebody who has African-American parents or whatever the situation, how they end up, or South Asian, right? How they end exactly. up together, you know, in the same space creating, you know, a, a Black German movement and a Black German consciousness and a Black German cultural identity, which is really fascinating. That And yeah. then that's why your work is so exciting to me. Oh, thank you. I mean, I think, but I think this idea of Black internationalism, I'd like to, to really tease out a bit more in the German case, because I think there's there's something there in terms of overlapping internationalisms um, that I can't quite, you know, I didn't quite mm -hmm. unpack mm -hmm. that as much as I want to, mm -hmm. in which it's sort of their 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 sort of cultural background is one sort of layer of internationalism yeah. their interactions with others across the diaspora in germany also is a another layer of internationalism yeah. and then of yeah. course their travels um you know right. um, allow them to forge different um notions of what internationalism can constitute for them so i think the black german case really is a, a really great example of like overlapping black internationalism mm, that's really <laughs> interesting identities in terms of how their identities are forged yeah. and um, how they um, how they sort of articulate political demands right. um, as right. well. Can I, can I ask one last selfish question and then we're going to open it up to everybody else to start asking questions as well, uh, which is the thing that I'm so struck by about your work. And one of the things that I love that you're doing is as a German historian, you're demanding that we start, move Ger start moving German history, you know, further through the 20th century, right? That, that we're moving beyond 1945, but now we're also moving beyond 1968. Right, and that was time has come for us to start writing German histories after 1989, even right, like uh, to write German histories from the 1980s onward, um, which is so fascinating. So, and it made me think about about then, you know, how does one do that kind of work? Like, how does one do that kind of historical work, that kind of methodological work, you know, archival work? And so perhaps if you wouldn't mind sharing with everybody, you know, what kind of archive did you have to build for yourself in order to do this kind of work? You know, because it's not the same as, you know, going into like looking at Nazi files from the 1930s that like abound, you know, and, and where we have these established narratives and we have the established archives, we have the established historical records, people look up the same document like 60 times, you know, so how did, what kind of archive were you, did you have to build for yourself in order to make this project happen? Yeah, that's a really good question. No, so yeah, my, my archive wasn't the Bundesaki, sadly. Like I didn't, have to, I, didn't, I didn't know. Sadly, and maybe also okay, <laughs> um, to, given my positionality okay, right. in certain German archives. Right. Um, but my archives were in Black German homes. Um, mm. So, for instance, for instance, when I was staying with Ria Cheatham, Cheatham, she basically was like, "Are any of these things of use to you?" She takes out this suitcase of sources. And they're like flyers oh and gosh. brochures and minute meetings from like um, national meetings. And I said, oh my God, yes. <laughs> and so I just like, like sat down at the kitchen table um, looking at material that she'd saved. Mm -hmm. And then I think um, one of the sort of most profound things for me was like stumbling across 20 boxes of Maya Eames material. So there was um, Regina Stein was moving out of her Berlin basement and she's like, you got to take this stuff out. I've got, I've got to leave. And so Rhea and I go in her little car and we pile all of these, you know, over 20 boxes of my stuff that's probably been there since she died in 1996. Mm. Um, and we, we moved them from one Berlin basement to another Berlin basement. Um, and now those sources are at the FU, the Free University of Berlin, um, in conjunction, I think, with the Audre Lorde um, um, collection. But to sort of go through some of her Fabican and thinking, to sort of look at um, um, outlines, all of these things, it was really sort of striking. And then like other individuals shared stuff, like Katarina Gantoya shared a few things, uh, and Ricky Reiser, so. Yeah, and I think what I love about that and what you're talking about I should also say is how, in order to do this work, the importance of you doing it, you know, that you had these relationships with different 
Black German activists and figures who could give you this material, right? And so it's such a different kind of history, you know? And as you've been talking, I've been thinking all along about how, you know, in some ways your own scholarship and the ways in which you've been doing this work is a reflection of exactly these kinds of Black German ties and connections that get made. Right, and that's what, it's just so fascinating to see it almost kind of come full circle from like the 1980s with these effective ties to, to this moment right now. I think with that, we should start opening it up for questions. I, I hardly dare insert myself here because I, I love your conversation and I could, I, I could listen to you much longer, but there are some really great questions from the audience. <laughs> And um, it occurs to me uh, in kind of tracking them, and there's even there's even seems to be a conversation in the questions and a, a response as you're talking. You seem to be responding to some questions that came up early. For all the advantages that Zoom has, this is one I haven't really thought about. I mean, you can't see the audience; the audience can see you. We have lists. I looked at the list, and the audience is this wonderful group. I don't know everybody in the audience, obviously, but it's this wonderful group of colleagues from Michigan, colleagues across German studies, some people I know from the German Studies Association, other people you would recognize from your groups. There's graduate students from here in our department. There's even a prospective graduate student in the audience. It's, I mean, this is an advantage of Zoom, but you can't see them, which, I, which yeah. is kind of too bad. So I'm going to try to represent them with my questions. Um, and to the degree that they identify themselves, I'll also try to identify them for you. Um, and I'll begin, I'll take them in order in which they came in, um, but acknowledge that Jennifer Fredette, who asked the first couple of questions, also later said, oh, you've already answered part of it. So I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna abridge it and ask just a part of it that I think, because her question was, what's specific about Germany? And you've said a lot about that. But something she asked that I think is really interesting in, in, in at the tail end of her question is, is there something country specific in how activists have responded to push past racism? What should black freedom and equality activists elsewhere in the world be learning from Germany? Mm -hmm. Jennifer, that's a good question. Um, I think what they should be learning from sort of black German and POC activists in Germany is that colonialism is so entrenched the legacies, the afterlives of colonialism are, is, are still so, um, so bound with notions of identity in the European context. I mean, you see that with Black Lives Matter movements across the globe this summer, the toppling of statues, the, you know, the sort of persistent engagement with the colonial past, the entanglements with the colonial past. And I think activists in, in Germany have been talking about this for quite a while now. I mean, it predates the Black Lives Matter movement. It really, you start to sort of see some of these discussions um, in, um, in the 80s, but you also see a little bit of these discussions in the, in, in the 70s. Um, and so I think it's important to sort of look at um, look at the sort of colonial past and Germany I think offers an example of that. Um, it, uh, I mean I think oftentimes the, the comparisons with Germany is like oh we can learn from them in terms of how they've dealt with um, the Holocaust and anti-Semitism um, and I think yine <laughs> yes no I mean let's not let's not delude ourselves with sort of the rod the increase in anti-semitism across Europe especially in Germany um and I think that in 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 dealing with uh come um, in in sort of really engaging with um Begangenheitsbewältigung coming to terms with the past that that was a delay coming to terms with the past um and that that's still there's still work to be done on that front so I think everyone's like let's look to Germany look at it and I'm like eh, Germany may not be the model for yeah. that. I, I mean, if I can also interject and point out something that I love about your book though, Tiffany, in terms of like, what is the model to my mind that pl other places can perhaps, you know, around the world can, can be inspired by or take with them. It's precisely these kinds of intimate emotional relationships, you know, that you work out um, that are, uh, that end up being so pivotal you know, which is a come, I know you turn to at some point affect theory, you turn to a bunch of different, different, uh, you know, theories and disciplines to, to, to work it out. But there's something about, we cannot, you know, underestimate the power of inviting somebody into your house and sitting on the couch with them and talking to them, right? And there's something about, we. I know I'm trying to be mindful of other people's questions, but there's something about the importance of space in your work, you know, and whether it's things like Audrey Lorde, Lorde clearing out the space of white folks and being like Black Germans get to know each other now and they're shocked and then so 
overwhelmed and overjoyed to be meeting other Black Germans, that they like lose their minds. You know, that there's something about, about the importance of these kinds of intimate, real friendships and connections and effective relationships that is worth reproducing. Um, because that's the work that's going to, and those relationships are the ones that are going to ultimately be transformative, it feels like with your work, Tiffany. And at the same time, it's the space inside of a, of a book or a poem too. I mean, that's metaphorical, I know, mm -hmm. but I mean, I'm, I, I find it incredibly striking in you know, what comes out of your research to say that re really, you know, it's, it's these poems and this book that galvanized a movement and, and this person, and at the same time, these structures, right? It's the in, institutional structures. So it's this, this play between, but of course that might not be specific to Germany, but the, the shape it takes in your book, I, I, that's for me, one of the really remarkable things is this play of structure and agency of, of uh, you know, affect and thought of uh, um, individuals and institutions, and you really get it both sides. There's a, there's a spin on the colonialism question that you raised, Tiffany, from Stephen Bishop, uh, who formulates this in a way that I haven't heard it yet, but maybe you have, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. He writes, in Cameroon, a former German colony, a colony, quote unquote, liberated by France and England, there's a prevalent nostalgia for German colonialism, that they did it right. He puts that in quotation marks, obviously. And Germany is the number one destination for study abroad, for Cameroonians, I take it. So his question is, has that mythologized German colonialism had any influence on Afro-German activism, or is it overridden by the Namibian genocides? Ooh, Stephen, that's a really good question. Thanks for coming, Stephen. Um, yeah, that's a... I think there's something to be said about the Namibian genocide, um, especially in how um, how Black Germans were sort of engaging with it. Um, they're also connected to Namibians in in Germany. They're connected to um, Tanzanians in Germany. So they have this cadre of like individuals who from the continent who they're exchanging ideas with. And I think there was never a sense that it was like, ooh, Germany was amazing. They did it right. I think so for black Germans, uh, they thought, okay, German, there, there was no, no Germans weren't gonna get a medal for colonialism. So they weren't gonna get a gold. Um, the French weren't gonna get the, the bronze or the silver. There was no medal for, for, for German colonialism. But I can see this nostalgia in terms of thinking about environmental spaces in Cameroon and also th Tanzania more broadly and how we see sort of Germans traveling to, um, to these spaces, especially in those post-45 periods, sort of this reimagining of how they see themselves and how they see their sort of their former colonies. So I think there is a sense that like Germans too historically have been like, oh, we're great colonists, we're awesome. Um, and I think all of that is, the, I think, when clearly we know this is not true, but it's like, um, and this is certainly not the colonial language, we're awesome. You know, yeah. this is not what Bismarck um, or like, you know, predicted him was like writing about we're awesome. But yes, in some ways, yes. Um, and so I think that's part of it that like, I think that black Germans are really challenging this mytholo mythologized notion of, um, of Germans as good colonizers. Whereas I think maybe sort of Cameroonians are like nostalgic for that past and which are like, oh, we think everything was great even though things weren't great. They've certainly yeah. seen better than what the yeah. French and the British were. Right, I mean, maybe if I can also interject a part of me, like, especially cause I know Tiffany and I have the, the West Indian connection. A part of me thinks this is reminiscent of conversations among Jamaicans today, for example, about like, rec like finally wrestling with the politics of colorism and being like, this is still a colonial mindset, even if the colonizer's gone, like this is still a colonial mindset, right? Like the colonial mindset can still exist, even if the, col even if the colonizer is in theory gone. So that's the first thing that sort of came to my mind um, in, in particular, but I know there, there are other questions. I wanna make sure that yes. I'm not sorry. talking too yeah. much. No, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm talking too much. So. No, but here, I'm gonna <laughs> take- I'm going to take one that's that is actually for both of you because between the two of you, uh, I mean, you uh, picking up on what you said, Kira, about um, T Tiffany's work really bringing the '80s and '90s into the fold of history. But between the two of you, you cover basically Black German, Black international history from the mid 19th century to the present. And so here's a question that asks you to connect the, I mean, connect your work basically between the two of you from Elizabeth first here at the University of Michigan, who thanks you for this event and asks, um, 
in what way were 1920s so-called bohemisms in performance, music, art, and literature folded into this Finding Our Colors Black German movement, if at all? So is there, and you started going in this direction, I thought at one point in your conversation, is there an arc that spans in some way from previous moments, such as the 1920s to the 80s and 90s, or are we dealing with one of these classic German ruptures all over, you know, between different periods in the 20th century? I mean, I don't want to speak too much for, for Tiffany here. The, the, the first thought I have, though, is that I think we're precisely in this moment of trying to undo that rupture, I guess is maybe how I would see it or call out that rupture for what it is. Um, and so by that, I, I mean that part of the work that is, I'm assuming and will be done in the future by, uh, you know, not necessarily by, but you know, just like the work that I'm, I'm hoping comes out in the future and that is starting to come out, I think anyway, is exactly pushing through that 1945 barrier. Uh, better. I mean, so I'm thinking about Robbie Aitken's work in particular. So the book, you know, Black Germany by Eve Rosenhaft and Robbie Aitken, for example, does go from, from the 1880 through the 1960s. So it does, you know, try to do that. And that last chapter does gesture towards the moment that Tiffany then picks up in her book with the 1980s. So it gets there a little bit. Um, and I know Robbie Aitken's working on a project on Black Holocaust survivors uh, trying to seek reparations from the government after World War II, right, and the Holocaust. So, so that work, I think, is starting to come along. Oh, thank, yeah, thanks, T Tiffany. Um, but, but I, yeah, I, I'm not, I, I'm not sure if we're there yet per se. But I'm curious to hear what Tiffany, what you have to say. I think we're not entirely there yet as well, but I do think that there are sort of moments um, about sort of, especially the 1920s when we think about um, um, anti-colonial activism in Germany mm -hmm. by sort of black Germans and other individuals of African descent. Like there's something about the 1920s too that seems to be a moment of reckoning in terms of race relations. So we have like the black car on the Rhine, we have all of these mm -hmm. sort of moments there that are sort of discussed by many individuals across the diaspora. Like I'm, I think I'm shocked at how many um, people of African descent were, were commenting on the Black Power on the Rhine, not yeah. only sort of Black right. Germans, right. but sort of thinking about African-Americans. So yeah. I do think that there's a moment in which the Black Power on the Rhine, um, and I should mention the Black Power on the Rhine is the, the sort of really der the, the derisive term for um, the French occupation of the Rhineland mm -hmm. um, in the rural areas um, after, World War, um, after World War I. And so 1919 to about 1930 is the sort of um, occupation, but I think the height of um, French colonial soldiers was like 1923, 1924. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's all of this sense that like the advocating for rights, for, um, for African rights, especially after sort of Germany undergoes decolonization are sort of pockets of, that are leading us towards the 1980. Um, um, and so I, I yeah. see that. Um, I mean, I guess if I would also say one thing, and I'm looking up, a because it's fun, you can put things in the chat, so I'm going to put in this primary source from the website that Tiffany, I run, uh, Tiffany and I run, uh, which is a Black German actor named Lois Brody in the 1920s complaining about how he's getting victimized and compared to the Black horror on the Rhine. So this is exactly. like, gives you one example of that. So so that's in the chat. Um, I know I have students from my Black Germany class here. They're gonna read it later this semester. So, um, you know, but the one thing, I sound like a conspiracy theorist when I say this, but because it's also in my forthcoming book, but I have a whole section on like how Black German history is about constantly fighting the history of erasure, mm -hmm. right? Is constantly fighting the history of denial, a history of erasure. And, and that what that erasure does then is it makes it, more difficult, not impossible, but more difficult to recognize these longer term intergenerational links, you know, um, that span the 20th century. So I'm, I'm excited about that work that needs to be done. But I also want to just take a moment to celebrate the fact that Tiffany has this book out at all, which, as I said at the beginning of this, of this, you know, meeting, the last time we really had um, a book published, a single authored English, you know, speaking monograph by a Black scholar. In, in Black German history or Black German studies with Tina Camp's other Germans. You know, so we now have Priscilla Lane's book, White Rebels in Black, and Tiffany's book um, on mobilizing Black Germany. And that's it's such a huge accomplishment just for those reasons. Just the fact that it exists at all and that we can keep turning to it and keep coming back to it in the future is it, that's the payoff to my mind in the long run. Yeah. So I can't yes, tell. Yes, I'm trying not to get emotional. <laughs> that was my stoic face. 
Yeah. So I promised I would take the questions in order, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump around at least once because uh, what, to, the, to the degree that I can tell, there's at least one undergraduate also asking a question. I want to give that person an opportunity, uh, and he's from your home institution, uh, hey. Tiffany, at New Mexico. Solon Johnson asks, um, says hello, and asks, uh, as you looked to post-1968 resources for research, have you noticed significant access to more voices and opinions in media and other forms of communication as being an asset or any other feelings towards this? I thought it was interesting how you discussed how there's a need to move to more contemporary histories. Thank you all for your great discussion. And if I can just tack on to that just a tiny bit, I, I find it, I, I mean, and Kira and I have, you know, corresponded about this a little bit, the fact that you're basically also writing a media history in this book, and that it's a very unique media history, like what kinds of media matter to compiling the archive? What did you have access to? And as Solomon's asking, like, what kind of voices come through in these media? I'd love to hear more too. Yeah, I did not anticipate writing a media history. Um, I think it's just the sources that I came across um, that I just kept finding that really indicated that, okay, this is going in this direction. Um, and I think it was very much driven. So, I mean, I didn't mention that I also went to, um, I also visited uh, uh, um, subcultural archives. So like feminist archives, um, lesbian archives. Um, and so I'm going through those journals. Um, I think I'm going through those physical journals that, um, so journals that I didn't even think would have anything related to black Germans and I found traces. And so those traces, indicate a larger connection to sort of mainstream movements and that they were seeking more um, more recognition and also connecting with sort of lesbian um, mainstream lesbian magazines um, and so I think it becomes yeah like you said you the question about sort of it be, it's a really a, a really interesting media study and I was like oh my god I didn't I hadn't envisioned that I was writing this but it has become and I think what's interesting is that sort of those those vernacular forms of culture are so pervasive 70s onward, 60s, 70s onward, that those become a medium for marginalized voices. Um, and that allows me to sort of get at the their agency and their ideas in ways I hadn't previously thought I would. Um, and so I think that's part of it, Solomon. Oh, I can't believe Solomon came. Solomon was in my modern Germany class and my human rights class last spring. I figured he might have been. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's, I mean, it's another example to my mind of like the fact that you're bringing in this media history speaks to the particularities of the Black German case, as well as perhaps also to thinking about different kinds and modes of Black activism around the world, that there's something, you know, and it's still the case I say, I would, I think in, in Germany today, or at least I've had this experience of going to an Afro hair shop and then there you can find a Black German magazine and buy it, you can get, you know, and same in Vienna, I was able to do that too, getting Fresh Magazine, which is a Black Austrian magazine. You know, so there's something about these spaces where these media publications appear that like, it, it, in order to know about them already, it's, it's sort of indicating that you're aware of a Black diasporic experience. It's yeah. really fascinating thinking about it that way. And to see advertisements. So like, for example, yes. seeing advertisements for Afro shops in yes. Afro Look and Afro yes. Keta, that they're really, yeah, they're, they're these, I mean, I think they're, they sort of are not like a blend of zines. So I feel like Afro Keta, Afro Look in a way, so they're blending the sort of zine format, um, but they're also like really fascinating sort of ethnographic um, sites for learning about black culture in a way that I hadn't previously imagined. And I didn't, I mean, I didn't think I would get any, um, issues, excuse me, of Afro Look. And then the editor Afro Look was like, here, here, like, here are my issues. And I was like, oh, oh my, my God. God. That's really and then cool. there's And then there's Uncle Tom's Fist. My yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a whole different Ooh. conversation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where I was like, oh my God, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, let's go back to the Q&A uh, queue. Uh, thanks to Tiffany. This is Christopher Molnar. Um, thanks to Tiffany and Kira for the great discussion. Congrats to Tiffany on the book, which I can't wait to read. I wonder if she can address how or if the people and groups she studies were shaped by and or responded to the rising tide of racism and hostility toward non-white people during the 1980s and 1990s. And maybe we can connect that to uh, who was it who was asking about the East West? Um, do you do you see it? Somebody was asking about 
uh, is maybe Anna Horakova is Anna Horakova I think it was yes it. yeah yeah yes uh, right both sides right. of the Berlin Wall right so I'll read Anna's question too um from Lafayette College. Thank you for this fascinating, rich conversation. My question would be for both speakers, but particularly for Tiffany. How was the Black German movement around Audre Lorde shaped by the German division and reunification? Did solidarity networks exist between both sides of the Berlin Wall? I'm thinking particularly of Maya Yim's essay on das Jahr 1990, Heimat und Einheit aus Afrodeutscher Perspektive, and of Peggy Piesch's research on Black East German experiences. Yes. So I will answer Chris's um, question first. Um, I think part of uh, Black Germans, especially sort of thinking about them in the 1980s and um, early 90s, is tapping this issue of the rising tide of xenophobia, um, and um, but also calling out xenophobia and saying it's not sort of the fear of foreigners per se, it's actually racism um, that's been entrenched in German society for centuries. And so it's, and it's sort of this, it's this notion at wanting to maintain homogeneity at deadly costs. When we think about um, um, when we think about Rostock and other sites, so also a lot of the sort of um, in the sort of '90s, uh, several um, asylum-seeking buildings and asylum seekers were, you know, Molotov cocktails were thrown at apartments. So there are various sites, um, and Turkish Germans were also targeted. And so there's this uh, there's this need for um, there's this need for Black Germans to uh, really sort of relay the fact that this is racism and this is also the cost of like what whiteness is in the German context that like whiteness is an organizing characteristic that is that is guiding these you know the violent acts um, and you see so um, and this is also another thing in terms of wanting to do follow-up research in Berlin who knows um, is that there was an East German an uh, East Berlin uh, group that was very very close with the the West German um, ISD um, group and they were actually connected prior to the fall of the wall and so I'd like to, to get more information about, you know, how were they connected? How were they meeting? Where were they meeting? What, what sort of activities were they forming? And so that the, the ever rising tide of ethno-rationalism in the 80s and 90s is really embedded in how Black Germans are trying to talk about notions of race and racism in the German context. And it's and and you see that on um, and you see that also later after the fall of the wall too. And so that ger um, Black Germans are um, petitioning for more funds from um, the Ward Council of Churches to to really do more um, networking in um, East Germ in the former East with sort of ISD chapters. And so they're really advocating for uh, more solidarity, but also undergirding this as this anti-racist um, argument. And they're getting training to do anti-racist. Um, workshops and a variety of those things. So the anti-racist workshops are, are occurring sort of in this 80s period. They're getting money also from the World Council of Churches. Um, and, you know, there are some new sort of, there's some graduate students working on this. Um, Pamela um, is a graduate student um, at the University of Geneva who's working on um, similar things. She's amazing. So that's it for now, Great. sorry. Do you want to say, I know uh, I, I sit on dissertation committees with Kira where she, she's the one who says, GDR, the West Germany is not everything. <laughs> it is not everything. It's true. Um, do, do you want to weigh in? Oh, no, I want to weigh in. Um, no, I think Tiffany, Tiffany answered that so well. And her work, I think, is doing, you know, I think what I really liked also about your work, Tiffany, is that you didn't do what I did, which is just have that East Germany chapter instead of woven throughout, you know, so I think in that way, you know, it's it's also going to be, I think, such an important uh, book for those reasons and deliberately, I think, erasing, not erasing, but but making clear that like we're not going to segregate necessarily East Germany from West Germany when we think about Black activism and Black diasporic activism. Mm -hmm. So that's what's really cool about it too. Great. Um, I want to give a, a, a grad student also a voice. Uh, this is Megan Pounds from here in Michigan saying, thank you for participating in this conversation. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you were able to navigate the tension between having sustained treatment of specific authors and scholars without losing the sense of your project as one which features grassroots activism and collective endeavors. So I guess it's a question about scholarship and activism, but also individual and collective. Yeah. That's a really good question, Megan. Um, I think I'm still negotiating that. Um, I have to be honest that I felt like it was a very difficult thing to uh, accomplish in terms of blending 
the discussion about the, the intersection of the global and the local and the individual and the collective in the book. And so I felt, at, I, you know, I guess people are not supposed to say this, but I felt like sometimes I didn't do it as well as I'd wanted to. Yes, you know, the book isn't, you know, it's not perfect, no book is. Um, and so I feel like that is a tension that I'm still struggling with to co fully convey, for me to co fully convey the complexity of these intersections of the individual and the collective, as well as the, the global and the local. I don't think I am able to do that as, as well, um, as, as, as well as I'd hoped. Um, and so I'm still struggling with that. Um, and I think I was also struggling with my own place in con being connected with these activists. And so I was balancing that tension too, that like I was invested in trying to to, to, to give the, the narrative the justice that I thought it needed um, because I'd connected with so many activists and you know fangirled after seeing, I was like, oh my God, I'm in Katarina Contoya's house. Can someone take a picture? Um, you know, like, so <laughs> I think part of that was just me like, oh my God, I'm at our kitchen table. Do what, what do I, yeah. So, and like wanting to like, you know, fangirl and hug, but also being like a shy, you know, shy graduate student who's like, I have to know my place and not like offend and like, you know. So I think I was negotiating, trying to like get the narrative, you know, and write a narrative that was very compelling, but also was true to who I think they were in doing this. And a quick aside is that I got an email from Marion Craft a couple weeks ago, um, who was like, you did a great job in the book. And I was like, Marion? Marion Craft? Um, so, and uh, uh, Rhea, Rhea Cheatham also like had sent me a message on WhatsApp and was like, Marion loves your book. I was like, Marion Craft? <laughs> <laughs> and I was, and then I got the email from Marion who was like, I love the book. We need to translate this. And I was like, I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. Well, I should also say, I know maybe you don't feel satisfied with what you're doing sometimes, but there is a way in which it feels in a good way, meticulous, like a lot of the, the reconstruction work that you're doing to try to point out these individuals as well as the collective. I think, I think there is something about how you're trying, you know, you're, yeah, that you're trying to, to bring together both the individual and collective experience. So that's what, that's what I would say. There was one other thing I wanted to say, but I forget now, unfortunately, but that's how it goes sometimes. I'll try to remember later. Well, text me. Yeah, sure. Yeah, text her. So I, I love, I love the fact that you acknowledge the, um, the unfinished character of the books we write, that that's part of it. And um, both in terms of you know, we do our best to, to craft an argument. And then the minute we send it off to the publisher, we realize I could have done this differently. You know, I would have liked to do this differently. And also in the sense that, um, you know, as you answer some questions, you open new ones and that you want to go back to Berlin. There's clearly lots left to research. And um, and I think that's also, you know, it's a, it's a tribute to the richness of your own work that it that it yields these new questions and, and, and new directions to go in. And I'm sure I'm sure it will uh, provide inspiration for others to do the same. And, and, and there's nothing more exciting than that. So I think I'm gonna, um, uh, although there are still great questions from my colleagues, Zik uh, uh, Weinek, from Damani Partridge, from Heike Lempa, from uh, Anna Tanalski, and there's people saying, thank you. Um, I do wanna be mindful of the fact that it's a Friday afternoon, that it's Tiffany's third event uh, in three days, um, that we've been very privileged to have both of you here. And um, I suppose I'm also gonna take this minute to invite everybody back to this quote unquote Zoom room for a sort of continuation of this discussion with the distinguished lecture on Europe that's coming up March 19th. And I'll drop that in the chat, um, which is Gary Young, who's a, a well-known journalist for The Guardian and The Nation and who bridges the Atlantic in fascinating ways with his research and his interviewing practices. He's now a professor at Manchester. And he'll be talking about um, uh, the um, European takes on uh, African American and Black Black American history and 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 activism. Um, so uh, come back and see that, um, and stay in touch with us all via email. Um, uh, you'll find Tiffany Florville at uh, University of New Mexico and Kira Thurman here at. The University of Michigan, and you both have my sincere thanks, and um, I hope you have a great weekend full of the relaxation you deserve. Thank you. Thank thanks. you. And goodbye.